At this hour, we repeat, these are the facts as we know them. And that's when she looked in the rearview mirror. Some technology from another dimension of the world. You're still afraid. I don't know what it was. This will scare you. Hello, I'm Shannon Brown, and this will scare you. Today we're talking with Erin Carrera. She's an award-winning screenwriter, award-winning singer-songwriter, actress, comedian, and playwright. And coming December 2020, she is starring in the new HBO horror docu-hybrid, Alabama Snake. It's the true story of a Pentecostal minister who was sentenced to 99 years in prison for the attempted murder of his wife via snakebite. Aaron plays the wife and guarantees that it will scare you. Aaron, this story sounds absolutely wild. I had not heard of it before you told me about it. Is, like, did you... Is there anything that you can share about it? Did you happen to do any research into the story for the role? Yes, I actually did intense research into the role because this is a true story. Obviously, it's a docu-horror hybrid, so docu. And the woman that I played is still alive. I, I wanted to meet her, but she was not really, she did not want to be met. Let's put it that way. She, <laughs> you will see her in the film, but she did not want to be met by me. I did meet her son. Um, in, and that was really fascinating. So I did a lot of research. I, first of all, when I was auditioning for the piece, I did not know what it was for. I just knew that it was for, honestly, I just knew that it was a SAG job <laughs> and that it was a <laughs> independent feature film and that it was based on real life events set in the South in the world of Pentecostal Christianity, which I didn't really I knew very basic things about. Mm -hmm. um, so I researched a lot specifically about this, this group of, I guess, sect of Christian churches. And this is, this is when you see the small little churches deep in the South. I think they're only in the South where people are dancing with snakes and mm -hmm. drinking poison. Uh, you know, it's oh going God. beyond the speaking in the in speaking in tongues, because I know there are churches across the world that do speaking in tongues. But this mm -hmm. is like they definitely dance with snakes. They drink poison because there's this verse in the Bible that says, well, shoot, I forgot it now. It's Matthew 13. I could go grab the nearby it Bible says, that I still yeah. have. <laughs> it says party with poison and dance with snakes. Basically, <laughs> it says that if you're a true believer, not even the snake can kill you. Not even poison shall kill you. And you shall speak in tongues of angels. Or it's, I'm totally misquoting. So I, I should have brought up the Bible quote, uh, which I actually originally memorized for the film because wow. I wanted to be, it's like Matthew 13, verse 17 through 18, or something <clears> like that. Um, I'm not correct now, but somewhere around there. But then I also began researching uh, what I could find about their story. Their, for example, this, in real life, Darlene, the woman I play, she went on Sally Jesse Raphael. Do you remember Sally Jesse or maybe, yes. I don't know, like, right, with the big glasses? And um, she, there are clippings you can watch of the court, not the court proceedings themselves, but afterwards. It was such a big story when it happened, uh, in, at least regionally and somewhat nationally, because, because here was a, a minister who was being convicted of, uh, attempted murder of his wife via snake bites, snake bite, their own snakes. So um, I can't say a whole lot about the film yet because mm -hmm. it hasn't come out, but you know, that's all on public record. I will tell you, I did get to, I did stunt work for this, which was really fun. Ooh. I we filmed in Scottsboro, Alabama, where it took place. I got to meet the EMTs that picked her up. Um, I got to learn from them a lot about what, snake bites can do to a person they're and, nasty oh my god they're scary frightening I mm -hmm. really I got to work with snakes I mean <laughs> and other animals other animal talent so it's a really wild ride and I have to say it was probably one of the most incredible experiences of my life to step into this woman's life for three weeks uh, very yeah. intense I mean I went through things that I now 
I now know I can survive extremities. Not because, you know, obviously it was an, uh, a SAG union said <laughs> HBO was involved. It's not like it was actually, I was actually going through things that this woman really went through. But even just putting myself as an actor in that position was, it was scary. Really, it will scare you. It's a disturbing yeah. story. Mm-hmm. Well, and like this was, I mean, to me, this is pretty recent. This was only in the 90s, right? Right. It was in the early 90s. So yeah. you're not really talking that long ago. And there are still people who dance with snakes, do you know, do the snake holding. And mm-hmm. recently, even, I want to say in the last couple of years, a preacher of some renown, because he would make all these YouTube videos, died of the snake bite. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, so part of me, I don't want to insult any of the very kind and nice Pentecostal folks I met because I certainly met plenty of people who had good hearts with great intentions, but I'm sure there's a certain amount of performance to it as well for some people, Yeah, you know, and not all Pentecostals obviously do the snake thing. A lot of them, a lot of the reason there was, um, some people say the reason Glenn was convicted of 99 years, not just life. Cause I think he was like 50 something when he was um, sent to prison, not just life, but 99 years was a statement to other people who do the, the work with the snakes because they many people it's actually not legal everywhere to do that first of all and many people want it to stop want to shut it down um, including yeah, yeah. certain other Pentecostals so it's not it, it's an it's a controversial thing well yeah I mean kind of going back to what you said about the performance aspect I kind of think that Anytime you're in front of an audience, there is a level of performance to that, whether you're doing, you know, improv or stand up or theater or you are, you know, a religious figure. If you're in front of an audience and you're presenting something to them, even, you know, as a teacher, there is a level of, you know, theatrics or, you know, you think about your delivery and how you're presenting yourself. For sure. So that you can connect with your audience, right? Mm -hmm. I just think about, I grew up in a, different kind of church altogether, a nice ELCA, boring Lutheran church. But even (laughs) then, our favorite minister was the greatest storyteller, right? He just was this amazing storyteller. And he always brought it back in a beautiful way, you know, with this sort of like tying a bow at the end to go along with whatever whatever the reading was for the week. So, you know, while I am, uh, for the record, I'm not, not that it matters. I'm not religious now. It was a really great way to grow up having that kind of performer in my, you mm-hmm. know, a church where I spent three days a week sometimes when I'm growing up. Yeah. Well, I mean, they have to be somewhat captivating to deliver their message and keep the attention of the congregation, totally. you know, and I guess what can be more attention grabbing than a friggin' snake bite. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, truth, right? I mean, I would be like, what is right? happening now? That's okay. Um, but if you, have, I don't know if you've ever taken a Kundalini yoga class, but I've had, so I have, I've gone to India. I've spent time in ashrams and I will tell you when I was watching, I watched like videos of Glenn and Darlene at their church that were two hours long. You can find them on YouTube. It's like a documentary someone made. And it's not, it's not, you're watching like half an hour of them singing the same song and dancing with the snakes. But I will tell you, it reminded me so much of chanting, Mm -hmm. whether chanting here at yoga classes or chanting at the ashram in India, because it's not like you just start dancing with snakes. You kind of work your way up to it. And then it's not just the snakes. It's like, oh, there's the music. There's the repetition of the music. There's the intention to focus on the divine and let the divine come through your body and create you get kind of high doing (laughs) kundalini yoga doing chanting so I'm like I could totally see the appeal of that especially if you are maybe a working class or poor person in Mm -hmm. a sort of area where there's not a lot available to you and I won't give away too many of the circumstances of their lives but the character I played wasn't exactly a member of the in crowd in her town you know she was an outcast for various reasons that had nothing to do with her but because of her family and the way social life worked at that time so I can totally see why she would a become a first of all her husband didn't become a minister wasn't a minister when they met he was a bad boy and he was very exciting and very sexy and she was the second wife and I can see why right with what I know about her growing up um 
I can see why she would a be totally into this bad boy fighter scrapper guy. And then number two, go along with him when he decided he'd heard the call of the Lord because now you're married and okay, well, I guess this is my life now. You know, she was very Mm -hmm. young. And then number three, see the appeal. You know, she's, I heard in an interview once where she said she actually would sometimes carry snakes in her purse when going around town, going shopping because it made her feel special. It gave her a certain specialness and power other people didn't have. So I would hate to reduce her to just this woman who just went along with her husband. I think she probably was a very powerful, strong person who grew up in a time when women and her specific instance didn't had very few kinds of power and Mm -hmm. weren't supposed to have desire or weren't allowed to have power, even though it was only in the early nineties when all of the crime part went down. Sometimes when my mom tells me stories, even about being a working woman in the eighties, it's shocking the things she went through. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Wow. They could say that back then. Wow. I mean, I can't wait to watch. (laughs) I'm really looking forward to learning more about it. I am very glad that it it was only attempted murder and that she's okay and she's still alive now. Right. I would say she's alive. (laughs) I don't know (laughs) how well she is. I don't know from what I've seen. I don't know that she's very well at the moment, but I really want to just send her so many blessings because I just think she went through something. Her whole life is something kind of incredible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm very glad that she survived. I think that's incredible. And I, I, it's great that you're able to take part in sharing that story. Yeah. It was an amazing opportunity and I'm really excited about the movie. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to see it. I mean, and even without seeing it, my two takeaways are don't try to kill people. Snake bite, very smart, diabolical. Uh, And just, you know, be kind to animals. There is a mystery in the film that I can talk about because it's public knowledge, which is she says, and he was convicted of attempted murder via snake bite. He says she faked the whole thing. Not that she faked the snake bite. That's on record. I met the EMT. He was like, the snake bites are real. And then the EMT himself, who is a lovely, wonderful man, said uh, whether she gave the snake bites to herself or he did, I don't know. When I'm an EMT, I show up and my focus is to keep this person alive and get them well. (laughs) Controversy. A lot of controversy. Yeah. I cannot wait. I I really can't wait for this. I'm going to be like (laughs) counting down the days. It's crazy. Um, So speaking of like weird bites, the other day I woke up in the middle of the night and I saw these two holes in my thigh. They were like kind of like puncture wounds. Mm. And then I saw these like spots of blood on my bed sheets. I have white bed sheets and it was like very apparent. And then I saw these dark, profound bruises on my leg. And that's when I saw it. There was this orb hovering in the corner. It was bright, like a fiery ball. And she felt like evil. I could hear her slurping as if she were savoring the blood that she just took from me. She saw me, now awake, noticing her, and she started to come towards my bed. And that didn't happen, but that orb woman is known as a Sukuyan. Now, the Sukuyan is a Caribbean shape-shifting vampiric hag who appears as a reclusive old woman by day. And uh, she's the Sukuyans are classified as jumbies. And a jumbi is the generic name given to all malevolent entities. And I believe the Ruguru from our last episode, it's this type of werewolf. Uh, he also falls into this category. Some people believe that Sukuyan uh, were brought to the Caribbean from European countries in the form of French vampire myths. These beliefs were also combined with those of enslaved Africans. At night, the Sukuyan removes her wrinkled skin and puts it in a mortar, revealing her true form. She's a fireball that flies across the dark night sky in search of a victim. As a fireball, she can enter the home of her victim through any sized hole, like a crack in the wall, under the door, or even a keyhole. 
She's just like a little mouse, only she's an immortal fireball who sucks blood. Sukuyan collect people's blood from their arms, legs, and soft meaty bits while they sleep, leaving the victim to find dark bruises the next morning. She normally doesn't take too much blood because they want to get as much as possible from their victims, so they might come back, you know, a few times. But if the Sukuyan does draw too much blood, it's believed that the victim will either die and become a Sukuyan themselves, or they just die entirely, at which point the creature takes the victim's skin and now has this new form to walk around with during the day. Mm, like that Kate Hudson movie. Which one? Oh, there's that movie where she's set in New Orleans and she's the nurse and she goes to care for the elderly man in the house. And, um, oh, what is it called? It's called like the, the something key or the 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 key anyway what it's it's similar to the story you're telling not exactly but very similar i don't want to give away the ending well, anyway i'm it's but it's a kate hudson movie circa i don't know 2004 maybe well it is interesting because there i think i might uh cover a little bit about it but i think that this legend although it's a caribbean uh legend it's also still somewhat believed by french creole people oh. so it might be you know somewhat cajun and you know if that story is set in new orleans it makes sense yeah so they do get into not exactly what you're talking about but similar and you know they get into voodoo or i i don't know a lot about voodoo so i and we're, we're reaching into my memory here, <laughs> which is um, a wild and wonderful place. Um, but the film itself, I've actually seen twice, like in the last two years. I saw it when it first came out. It's got one of the Skarsgård brothers in it, too, I think. I think that's who it is. And um, Jenna Rollins? No, not Jenna Rollins. Uh, is it Jenna? Maybe it's Jenna Rollins is in it, too. Um but it's it's actually I saw it again maybe a year or two years ago, and I thought it was still scary, even though it was the second time I was watching it. Well, add that to the watch list right after Alabama Snake, you know, <laughs> a good pairing, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the Sukuyan practices black magic. They exchange their victims' blood for powers with Basil, who is the demon of death. And he was trapped in this massive silk cotton tree by a carpenter. Basil needed to find a way to have some sort of power while he was imprisoned. And one day he saw an old woman walking by. Knowing that she was in the last chapter of her life, he tempted her with immortality and powerful magic if she served him. He told her about this secret way to make a special oil that could only be made at midnight in a cemetery, out of the organs of a recently buried body. The old woman did as she was told, and with the oil, she shed her skin and became the first Sukuyan. The Sukuyan share the same weaknesses as demons since they were created by one, and this is primarily illustrated by being able to ward them off with salt. To figure out if you're dealing with a Sukuyan, you throw piles of rice or salt around the house. The creature will be compelled to gather and count every grain one by one, and you'll be able to catch her in the act. Oh, I think yeah. they do that in the film, by the way. Oh, interesting. So maybe it it, it could be, um, you know, some sort of variation of this story. Yeah, or at least they borrowed from the mythology to create their circumstance. Yeah. Um. I sometimes wake up with bruises and unidentified bites, which I usually attribute to spiders. <laughs> I guess I know there's spiders in my house. But I often have um, just like like my partner, Carla, will be like, where'd you get that bruise? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> that, <laughs> no idea. Same thing with me. My It's always my legs. And my boyfriend's like, what happened to you? And I'm like, I have no idea. Maybe the dog or one of the cats walked on me. I don't know. <laughs> What's the thukwe on? Yeah. So if you do come in contact with her and you want to destroy her, you have to put coarse salt in the mortar containing her skin. 
So I'm thinking it's probably like a diamond kosher salt or maybe like a Maldon salt flake, like something fancy. I have you know? a lovely uh, Himalayan pink sea salt here. I've got uh, um, some Celtic sea salt. Maybe that would work. Combine the forces <laughs> as long as it's coarse. So I think so. I think that she needs to assume her human form during the day or some alternative to the fireball. And now that her skin has been ruined by all the salt... I guess it kind of like dries it out or maybe makes tears in it or something. So now that the skin is ruined, she's unable to put it back on and she dies. So the Sukuyan's immortality is only to a point. Like she can live forever unless you destroy her skin. Right. Someone has to actively stop her Mm -hmm. for her to not live forever. Okay. Yeah. So belief in Sukuyans is still preserved to an extent in Guyana and some Caribbean islands, including Dominica, Haiti, and Trinidad. There also uh, seems to be some versions in French Creole cultures as well. And the skin of the Sukuyan is considered valuable and is used when practicing black magic. And much like the Ruguru, that werewolf, the Sukuyan is said to be used as a deterrent, mainly with children. Telling, you know, kids, if you don't say your prayers, if you don't behave, the Sukuyan will come and get you. Oh. It's also said that this is a cruel legend because elderly women who are not behaving in a neurotypical way are positioned as something evil that should be feared instead of treated with compassion. Right. And the legend of the Sukuyan has been verbally passed down over the centuries and, of course, the story has changed with the passage of time, so the Sukuyan is no longer exclusively described as an elderly woman. Since she's a shapeshifter, she can be seen as anything, which to me is kind of more scary. You don't know yeah. what is, you know, what is containing a Sukuyan. Could be Kate Hudson. It honestly, it could be. <laughs> sorry Kate (laughs) Uh, so the next time that you see a light shoot across the sky or you happen to find unexplained bruising on your meaty little body be careful because you might have just narrowly escaped a sukuyan (laughs) so what do you think about this cryptid this monster do you think uh, it could be possible do you think it's well, just like a fun thing to scare kids. I'm of two minds because first of all, part of me thinks, does it always have to be an old lady? Couldn't it be an old guy too? <laughs> but then I think, you know, many, many cultures the, in these, this particular instance, it's the Sukuyan, but there are definitely, you know, I'm part Finnish and fin- the Finns have a long shape shifting uh, uh, stories. I'm actually Sami as the very far Northern part of Finland, the indigenous peoples up there, they're known as Sami. And Samis uh, have shapeshifter mythology, shapeshifter lore. In fact, the Santa Claus story is related to Sami lore. It's a whole other story for another time. So part of me thinks, you know, like this is a sort of variation of a story I've heard in other cultures as well. So part of me thinks, you know, probably came from somewhere Mm-hmm. Some, you know, something where some story that, you know, was a way to explain why a certain lady was the way she was. Like, why is that old lady that way? Mm-hmm. Instead of maybe she has dementia and yet great skin, um, maybe because she's a Sukuyan. She made yeah. a deal with Basel or whatnot, right? Um, I have to, I will say though, I've seen orbs, even my partner, who's like as non fantastical as they come once with our, our little dog, um, who we used, we used to have a dog. He died sad, but, um, Aww. our little dog once was literally playing with little blue orbs and even <gasps> Carlo himself saw it. Carlo was like, what is that? And I was like, what's well, an orb? And he's like, what's an orb, right? Like what? It was like, you could just see this little blue energy ball. And Whoa. I mean, I I have had my experiences. I don't necessarily believe things without, you know, seeing or really understanding them. But I when I have somebody who's like his hobby is astrophysics. He's a former police officer. You know, like he's as logical <laughs> a detective, as logical as they come. And very a former, pragmatic. Uh, very pragmatic. He's a Capricorn, for goodness sake. Um <laughs> you know, very known for being pragmatic. Um 
when I have something like when something like that happens to him, I'm like, oh, wow, that wasn't just Henry playing with a piece of fuzz and me projecting onto it. That was Carlos saw it too. So, you know, were we sharing a shared projection? Maybe. Was it really just a little blue orb and an elemental of some kind? Yeah, who knows? It didn't feel like evil or like it was something trying to come suck our blood later. Um, <laughs> it just liked then, your dog. Just like Henry. But on the other hand, I, you know, I, I do wake up with bruises. So who can say? Maybe. I was very excited to find a female cryptid because yeah. normally you hear about just like male ones, like Bigfoot, the Rougarou is, a, is, you know, allegedly male. And I was like, you know, I found it really interesting that a lot of these like unknown creatures these like mystical beasts or maybe real beasts are perceived as male yes and then i found it even more interesting that this one that made a deal with the devil was a woman right you know i was like that was really cool because i mean myth mythically i guess women are perceived to be like closer to nature and therefore more susceptible to like the supernatural. So I was like, this is really interesting. Or even I'm thinking of Grindel, you know, and Beowulf. Um, mm -hmm. Or is it Grindel? Is Grindel the mother? It's, you know, it's been 20 years now. Is Grindel the mother or is Grindel the son that, that she has to avenge? Anyway, that Beowulf must go after. But that's the, the dangerous mother there too. But yeah, yeah you're right. Generally speaking scary creatures are perceived to be male and yeah and uh it's i guess yay feminism <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah thank you thank you feminism thank you uh Sukuyan. we're we're Evil winning in this equal fight opportunity <laughs> yeah well and that's kind of the thing too i'm like you know women are only seen as like witches i guess or like the loch ness monster i think is supposed to be That's female true. right but i was just like this is kind of cool and i had never heard of this before so i thought that was pretty interesting too that you know in a lot of these stories they kind of, they can tend to stay in the region that they were created yeah. you know instead of being passed around worldwide so I was really excited to be able to learn about something I had never heard about before. Yeah, it's I've never heard of this, and it's pretty intriguing. Also, because I have heard a lot about orbs, right, over the years. And, you know, I have spent time, maybe 10 years ago, I think, looking through old pictures, looking for orbs. <laughs> you know, like, like some of the old snapshots from childhood. Are there orbs in these pictures? <laughs> yeah. Well, because those, those were not digital. You can't fake that stuff. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you have a ghost story for us. Do I you, do. Are you ready to share yes. that, to scare us? My ghost story is set in Beechwood Canyon. So for the people who are not from Los Angeles or not familiar with Los Angeles geography, Beechwood Canyon is a, a neighborhood uh, in, in Hollywood that is very close to the Hollywood sign, the very famous Hollywood sign. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a friend, or I still have her, but she doesn't live there anymore. So I have a friend, we'll call her Susan, because that's her name. And Susan <laughs> lived... <laughs> <laughs> and Susan lived in this big, gorgeous house in up in the hills of Beechwood Canyon, actually not very far from the Hollywood sign. Like people would park sort of outside of her house to go take a picture, for example. Uh, in order to get to her house, you would have to park on the street and then you would have to get buzzed into the gate. The gate would open and you would walk up. It was built on the top of a hill. So you'd have to walk up a bunch of stone steps you know, to get to her house. So you're talking maybe at least uh, a story just to, or a story, maybe even two to get to her, her actual house built on the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. So Susan and I were hanging out one evening, some Saturday evening, pretty late. We were look in her living room and we were looking at something she was doing on her computer. And I had sort of arrived, I had been there maybe, I don't know, long enough to start a glass of wine, right? Like, but not drink the glass, just have a few sips. So, you know, 15 minutes maybe, right? 
And all of a sudden, I saw a woman walk by the window in front of us. And I thought, oh, Susan, did I? My first thought was, I think I left the gate unlocked mm -hmm. because I, I just saw a woman walk by. And then as I was sort of like thinking about the woman who had just walked by, I realized she was wearing kind of a strange outfit. Like it was sort of from like the 30s, like that kind of outfit. And wait a minute, she was all white. And Susan kind of chuckled at me and said, oh, did you see that? And I said, see what? And she said, go look out that window. And I went and I looked out the window and it was two stories down a drop. To I have full body chills and I'm going to cry. This is so scary. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was in the moment because I'm looking down and way down, uh, way because we were now in the top of her house, right? Wasn't mm -hmm. this top floor. So you enter her house, there's yet another floor. So, you know, to get up to her house is a story. And so now we're on the second story of her two story house. So I'm looking out the back side, not the front. And it's two stories down to this sort of like garden area. So there's no way someone walking by, it was somebody floating by the window. I'm, I'm getting my chills again too, just thinking about this woman. And given that we were, and I was like, oh, do you know her? Or did you see it? She was, I was like, what do you mean? Did you see that? And she was like, oh, it's one of our ghosts. And I was like, one of your One ghosts? of them. <laughs> oh my God. So and I was like, are you okay with that? And she was like, well, she just came with the house. Um, <laughs> so it was like in her mind, yeah, this is probably one of the original residents or something. I always thought, given the proximity to the Hollywood sign and given the way this woman was dressed, that it was Peg Entwistle, of course, the actress who committed suicide by throwing herself from the sign. Oh, I've got some chills when I say that, which makes me think it's true. But it was one of the weirdest things ever because, of course, my brain instantly wanted to put it in context. Like, oh, I must have forgotten to close the gate behind me. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, I was not going to leave that room with Susan in that exact moment to go down and close the gate. And when no I left way. the house that night, I was like, <laughs> just like booking it down looking, the stairs. I was, I was looking all around, like, let's keep the street lights on until I get to my car. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, right? Because it was like very scary until I, oh I God. did go back and, mm -hmm. and I, relaxed about it and I almost you know I had to really talk myself into relaxing around it and then I did but I, you know I hung out at Susan's that particular house she lived at a few more times but that was so clear this woman I can still see her just kind of walking by and it was strange because it was like I knew she was aware that I was watching her but she didn't look at me at all but like you know like you can tell when there's an awareness I so I knew she knew it, in the moment that is, I don't have words for it. It's just so creepy and cool. And one of my good friends, her, one of her biggest, like we talk about our irrational fears, like what is something that would never happen, but if it did, it's very scary to you. And one of her fears is that she's going to open the curtains on a second or third or fourth, however many story window and see someone out there. Yes. And that happened to you. Yes. It's scary. Oh, my God. And Susan so, saw it. And Susan knew her. Right? <laughs> yeah. She's just like, oh, that lady, she's cool. Right. <laughs> it's just one of our ghosts. I wonder if that's, you know, the, like in hauntings, there are like different types of hauntings. And I wonder if she was walking on something that used to be there before it was remodeled. Like maybe right. that was a deck or that part was the living room. Right. Very possibly. I mean, there's, I, that's a great point. What was it like there when that person would have been alive and what would she have been doing? Yeah, very likely this house, um, you know, was an older home, but I don't know exactly when it was built. And so who mm -hmm. knows if it even had been built after a building or something that Peg had lived in. From what I know about Peg Entwistle, because I have, which is through podcasts, I've listened to, you know, maybe two or three different podcasts about her. And I've read a little bit about her. She lived in that area when she, right before she committed suicide, she lived in that area. And um, with her, I think her husband was like a 
didn't necessarily live with her at that time or they were divorced and he was also a traveling actor or something like that. Or maybe she lived with her aunt and uncle. That was the house where she lived with her aunt and uncle. Anyway, so who knows if that was something that had been an original home that had been raised or they had just changed this home. Who knows? That's definitely one possibility. So you did know. Susan say she had like interacted with this apparition before or that like, you know, it was just she'd seen it before? Just that she had seen that one and that she had seen another one um so we were in a living room and the we were facing east the window we i was looking out of was facing east um and then so therefore to the north was the kitchen and a dining room and uh, it went because of the way the house was built on a hill like the the by the time you get to the living room the hill sloped down and mm-hmm. right so very there very well could have been another story or a deck or something out there but the kitchen opened up to like the top of the hill or the dining room opened up the top of the hill where there was like a little gar- another little garden and it was a pretty big house and um uh the she said outside in the garden there was a man who never came in the house just stayed in the garden but i never yeah I know. <laughs> Shannon's giving it, me this look like it ah! feels worse. Oh my god! Right, that he was just he a man that in. stands out there. Yeah. Oh, I right. would. It's you creepy. know, at that point, I'm like, just I don't know, murder <laughs> me, a, something, or, or maybe get some Ghostbusters to clear the house, do a clearing. But I think yeah. she didn't want to do a clearing because she felt my friend, this particular friend of mine, is very unique, and she's very kind of magical herself, and she. um she felt that they came with the house, that it was their home too, you know? And I was like, I'll tell you, if there was a rat infestation, I wouldn't act like it was the rats <laughs> that also belonged here. But I, but you feel differently with spirits, I suppose, because she wanted to respect, I don't want to say their humanity because they weren't alive, but, you know, their spirits, I suppose. Yeah. She wanted to respect their souls, whatever was going on. But I, I, you know, if it were me, I probably would have asked some sort of, psychic or someone who specializes in that to compassionately release them um yeah because i mean some people view it as you know this is their home too or you know they used to occupy this space they're allowed to be here and some people view it as they're stuck here because they don't have you know clarity or whatever it is and they they need to be helped over to whatever the other side of the veil is and if it's a suquion shape shifting as a spirit, that's a whole other kind of, you know, problem, right? Yeah. What if these aren't really necessarily the spirits of these people who have passed, although then I understand we're not talking ghosts per se, mm-hmm. but there's some sort of other entity utilizing the energetic form that used to be there and right, just in the visage of yeah. this yeah. former person. I don't well, know. That's you know Susan should thank her lucky stars that there weren't any children because I've heard that if there is a child spirit it's thought to be a demon really? a demonic entity because Ew. you because like as you know as adults or even as like teenagers you know you're gonna help a child and yeah. if you hear like children's voices or Ew. laughter or you see a child <laughs> it's supposed to be demonic uh. yeah uh. So did you believe in ghosts like before you had this experience? Did you, had you seen anything or experienced anything before this woman? I did believe they existed. I had had an experience when I was little, but I'm not saying that I now, I don't know now as an adult. And at that point in time, um, a few years ago, as an adult, I don't know that I believe my childhood experience was a ghost story or imagination I don't know because I was like seven or eight years old and I was at my grandma's farm and um, my grandma lived alone on a farm so my grandfather had died and my dad had taken my brother to town because this was in, in rural southern Minnesota uh, and he had taken my brother to town to go swimming at the local high school pool or something like that you know And it was just me and my grandma in the house. And grandma said, can you go outside and pick strawberries? Because she grew strawberries. And I went outside to pick strawberries. And here's her house on the farm. She had uh, a big shed, a couple silos, uh, the barn. And then beyond the barn, 
past that quite a ways because she did alfalfa and soy in addition to her own flowers, strawberries, and garden. They had big, huge, long alfalfa and soy farms, you know, prairie, the, lo the great plains part of Minnesota. And beyond the barn was an old silo and an old barn, the old pig barn, they called it. And I saw what I thought was my dad waving from the top story of the old pig barn. And he was like saying, come here, come here. He wasn't saying come here, but he was like beckoning, like, come here. And so I was, I ran over and as I got close to the pig barn, I looked up, I couldn't see him anymore. And I walked around to the side and that's when I realized, oh, right. The pig barn not only is empty, but had had a fire and was kind of half burned out. There's no way to get to the top window. Well, I don't know if that was a ghost because it was, if I thought it was my dad, my dad is well and alive as far, and he is, he was, he hadn't died in a car accident. It wasn't like that, which would be very scary if that had happened, but he hadn't, he was well alive, still is today, um, thankfully, but like, um, maybe it could have been one of the, his uncles or cousins that had died or a figment of my imagination. I don't know, or a spirit taking on his form to get me. All I know is I was scared and I ran like hell back to the house and I didn't have the strawberries <laughs> <laughs> you're like not today grandma right. don't talk to me <laughs> I think I it was like there's a man in the barn and then she got really took it very seriously I think I, I don't remember very well and just said we'll stay here until we'll stay inside we'll lock the doors until your dad gets back you know she probably thought I really did see a, a real man like a real man like, Right, who shouldn't have been there, but um, you know, little old lady living alone on a farm, she probably was well versed in safety measures and such. Mm -hmm. But, um, but uh, this was a long, long time ago. My grandmother has since passed, but so I and then the other reason I did also believe is twofold one is I have a family member who does see spirits who's like, like, very like she doesn't, um like to talk about it publicly so I won't say who it is but I'm really close to this family member and I I know she's not making things up but mm -hmm. more importantly remember when I talked about how my partner here had seen the orbs and I was like okay so now I'm really seeing something I had had another boyfriend who was a a nuclear engineer and German okay like as as scientifically minded <laughs> and rational as you can get and he told me why he believed in ghosts because once he had been with his a college friend and they had gone to another friend's who owned a castle like you know one of these old castles anyway this, this guy amazing, owned a castle amazing. right um like in dresden and they were just sitting around drinking a beer what like but not like drunk according mm -hmm. to him um when all of a sudden a knight in armor walked through a wall and frank said whoa, whoa. It said to report it back to me in English, but of course it would have been German, which I don't, so I don't know how to say it, but like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> right? And the guy and his friend was like, what was that? Because these are scientists, right? You know, like science and business yeah, that's like people, economists or something. Straight up Ghostbusters stuff. Right. And the guy who owned the castle said, oh yeah, uh, reportedly the castle's haunted. <laughs> I love that, like, in all these stories, the homeowners are just completely chill with it. They're like, it's, right. it's whatever. It's fine. Right. Look, I live here. I pay taxes. It's fine. Right. This is a 14th century castle. What do you expect? <laughs> yeah, it's going to come with a few, uh, you know, oddities here and there. Right. So that is a completely yeah. secondhand story. But the fact that my extremely rational boyfriend and, like, a scientist and not just a scientist but like a nuclear engineer and mm -hmm. then later turned businessman you know like, like he is not one to go for the woo woo at all like just wasn't wasn't like I remember once telling him about herbalism and we went to like the herb shop and he was freaked out because oh. he thought it was like like he, he was like freaked out because it wasn't western medicine and he thought it was some sort of like folk medieval folklore type situation i'm like honey it's an herbalist it's fine you can you know yeah, like yeah. saint john's ward is what we're after here it's like <laughs> <laughs> but you know so he was extremely not actually not not cool with woo woo but a little bit not cool with woo woo like he would never like once i wanted him to take a yoga class with me and he's like no <laughs> oh wow so it was like that yeah to that rational. extent yeah not like 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 an atheist completely disinterested in religion like very 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 like 
no, if I, if you can't prove it here with a slide rule or a mathematical <laughs> equation, not interested. But he had seen it, so. Yeah, he's like, show me the ab- on the abacus, where is the knight walking through the wall? <laughs> yeah, basically, right? <laughs> and like for years, I'm sure, I don't know, because I haven't spoken with him in many years, but I can imagine he probably, you know, that he's the kind of person who would go on to say, well, was it, you know, did they use a hologram and were they playing some elaborate sort of, but it was a long time ago, so it wouldn't have been a hologram. You know, mm-hmm. was it like, some sort of Scooby-Doo style secret camera hiding somewhere playing a trick. Yeah, like a projector. Right, you know, but you would think like I if that had been the case that it had been some sort of practical joke, they would have had a good laugh and let him know at a certain point. And that never was the case. So I I definitely believe these things ghosts for sure, whatever they are, I don't know. Spirits and ghosts, you know, and in terms of other supernatural creatures, my sort of point of view is I neither believe nor disbelieve. Like I'm open mm-hmm. to the existence of a supernatural creature. I don't know that I'm really keen to meet one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't even like raccoons because I don't like wild <laughs> animals that are not afraid of me. You know, like I don't want it. <laughs> like wild animals should have a healthy respect for humanity and vice versa. And so if you're like, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, recently I was here pulling into my garage like late at night two, three months ago. And there was a raccoon. I share an alleyway with a restaurant, but the restaurant hasn't mm-hmm. been open since COVID. And, um, there was a raccoon just kind of walking down my alley. And I was like, I've never seen a raccoon out here anyway. And I was kind of waiting for him to get out of my car. I mean, I was like to move along and he like didn't move and didn't move. And I was like, I'm exhausted. I have to go inside. And I opened the door and he was just like kind of hanging out like as if I was going to like feed him (laughs) or something. And I was like, shoo. And he was like, looked at, gave me a look like fine. You bitch. Right. (laughs) He he was walking along and then I pulled out my camera and he kind of just turned and looked at me and I'm like, I don't like that a wild animal has no fear of me. (laughs) Right. Totally. (laughs) Oh, is this a red carpet moment? But it was like, I mean, I, I mean, I have a respect for the fact that maybe he was somewhat domesticated or people had fed him, but I don't know this creature. I don't like that. He's not afraid of me. I, you know, I'm like, I'm not going to do anything to him, but I want him to be like, Oh, human, I should run away. Not human. Yeah, I think because we what live in LA, <laughs> like we're in LA. There's a bunch of people, and I think that animals, like wild animals here, are slightly domesticated because of the population. Like there's just so many sure. people on top of people. Okay. And I remember when I lived in Hollywood, there was a neighbor who like let their cat outdoors, and. I w- it would like sit up on this um, like retaining wall that was right outside my front door. And one night I like go to take the trash out and I see the cat and I raise my hand to go pet it. And I'm like maybe three inches away from touching it. And that's when I realized it was a possum. And <gasps> oh, <laughs> the possum and I like locked eyes and we were both like, I'm so sorry, this shouldn't be happening. And we both went in opposite directions. <laughs> And like I, I know that I scared this poor thing because it was like it's nighttime. I'm allowed to be here, right? <laughs> and oh. we both just were like, "Oh shit, we're sorry," and just kind of booked it, and <laughs> everything was fine. But like, I have coyotes on my street, and I've you know, yeah, we've had to be a little fast walking the dog and making sure that you know we respect the coyotes and we want to keep that distance between us for sure. Yes, especially depending on how big your dog is. Well, my little Henry was 15 pounds when he was alive, and he was wanted once we were house sitting or dog sitting for a friend that lived up in the hills. And at night, we would hear the coyotes, and he would get so excited and he would mm-hmm. bark and he'd want to play with them or fight them. And I was just like, no, babe, you are not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you are yeah. a tasty little morsel to those coyotes. So, yeah. Yeah, you are a snack, my friend. <laughs> right. No, they just need to get their ketchup and mustard and maybe a little mayo and you're good to go. But yeah, you're right. Being in an urban area, probably it wasn't as nefarious as I imagined. He probably was just like used to probably people being like, oh, hey, here's my leftovers. Enjoy, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Speaking of, sorry, my one of my cats just jumped up. I love <laughs> tried... it. Which cat is this? Her name is Sophie. She Sophie. is our uh, most rotund cat of the house, <laughs> and she also has asthma. But she's got Aww. the biggest personality, I think, of all three of them. She's a uh, definitely 
inquisitive and she's doing something else now. Well, and speaking of animals, they're supposed to also be able to sense these, you know, supernatural occurrences. And whenever they're, Sophie is one that will always do it. I don't know if she's actually seeing something or if she's just being weird, but she will like definitely stare into corners for a long time, very intently. And most of the time I'm like, she's just being a cat, but there are those days where I get, I do get a little bit freaked out and I'm like, what is she looking at? And then like the other animals might start like looking with her and I'm like, okay, all of you need to stop whatever you're doing. doing." (laughs) Enough. Yeah, this is weird. But have you ever seen, I don't, I haven't listened yet to, of course, to your other podcasts, but have you seen a ghost? I, so I don't actually think I've talked about this on other episodes, but I do. So I, I think I'm kind of the same way that you are. I, I think I kind of toe the line between being a believer and being a skeptic. I'm open to all of this. You know, if it's not real, I think it's very fun and really interesting to learn about because like the Sukuyan or, you know, other legends, I think there's a lot to be learned about the culture through their beasts, you know, and even with, um, with ghosts and apparitions, I think that there's a lot to be learned about how we see those things. You know, I grew up Catholic, uh, you grew up in a church as well. Like did our backgrounds kind of add to that? And I think all of it's really interesting with all of that said, I do think I saw ghosts twice in my life. Once I was like, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11. And I grew up in Pennsylvania and we were up and there was a school in our neighborhood with this big open field. And my cousins and I went up there to like go play. And right next to the school, it was like um, I don't know, some kind of church right next to it was a cemetery. And, you know, it was it was normal to me. I just I grew up there. But I distinctly remember we're in the grass and I look over and I saw what looked like a Victorian woman and man. The woman was in, you know, like this elaborate white dress with one of those hats on. And the man was in like a proper suit for that time. And I saw them walking, but not walking. I didn't see their feet. Like I saw them moving through like near the cemetery through the parking lot. And I don't know. I actually haven't done any research into the land or that cemetery to see if the time period fits, but I swear I saw that. And I grabbed, like, I was the oldest. I'm the oldest of three kids. I was the oldest, you know, with all the cousins there. I grabbed everyone and I was like, we are going home. Yeah. This is too freaky. I don't like this. And the second time I worked at Eastern State Penitentiary in Philly It is now, it's like, you know, a defunct penitentiary. It was the nation's first penitentiary. Um, Oh, So, and they they did, there were a lot of, like, horrific punishments. It was essentially torture for those prisoners when it was supposed to be a place of reform. And, you know, they, they were supposed to go in there and, you know, be able to change their lives and come out and be productive people. But they did really terrible things to these prisoners. And I worked there as part of the haunted house. It's like one of the nation's top 10 haunted houses. And they they actually have protesters every year because people think it's wrong. Mm -hmm. But it's their main source of income to be able to fuel the museum aspect all year round. So that they can, you know, talk about, you know, the prison system and the justice system and the country. And I, they called it the spinny barrel. It was this metal tube that you were in and on either side was a door. So people would like come in on one end and like if this little spot is like the spinny tube, I could pop out here and scare them. And then they would make their way all the way around. I could pop back out again (laughs) and Uh scare them on the other side. And that was a spinny barrel. It was very fun. Um, Definitely scary. And I had the door on the second side open um, because, you know, I was waiting for people to come through on the first side and I saw someone leaning against the wall smoking. And Uh of course, like we have like fog machines and like, you know, lasers and all like 
the like spooky stuff and i was like oh that's really weird because like i'm asthmatic and i pick up on uh smoke smoke like you know cigarette smoke pretty easily yeah. i was like that's weird i didn't think i don't think people are allowed to smoke in here and i'm like looking longer and longer and i was like huh that guy looks kind of weird and i don't think he has makeup on and i don't think he has a costume on and he also isn't really acknowledging anyone around here. Oh, that's really weird. And then I just like closed the door on that side because I got really creeped out. And I was just like, hmm. So like the way it worked was every, uh, like you were put into groups, basically. Like the, the haunted house was separated into zones. Like one was the medical ward. We were kind of like, we in our zone we wore these dickies jumpsuits and they had like these like bubbles on them like i guess we were supposed to be like mutants or monsters or something and everyone had like so you had your like denim jumpsuit like work covers on and face paint and this guy didn't have that like yeah. he clearly was not working at the haunted house he clearly and like granted people would say like it could have been like a a straggler some sort of audience member a guest what have you who like you know hung out they didn't do that like people who misbehave in haunted houses they like reek like weed they reek like alcohol they try to punch people in the face like they actively try to cause yeah. a problem they don't just like hang out and like smoke a cigarette in the fog yeah. so, so <laughs> i definitely like I don't know what I saw. I don't think that it was a person. And granted, I was working. That was my second full-time job. So maybe it could have been some sort of like, you know, sleep uh, deprived induced hallucination or something. But that was the only time I thought I saw something in that wow. penitentiary. And, you know, like after that, you know, going in, I did have like some sort of respect for the place, but after I saw that, like I, it really clicked for me. Like this was a very powerful place. And if you do believe in ghosts, you know, and you do believe that, you know, pain and suffering can tie someone's spirit or soul to a place, then that place is probably very active. And I know that a lot of, you know, ghost shows have like covered it. But it was, it was really weird. It was yeah. very interesting working there. I was, I'm still very happy to be able to, to have been someone who was able to help bring more money into the museum aspect of it and the preservation of it. Because there is a lot of history there and I do think people need to learn more about prison, <laughs> how prisons yeah. work and the justice system. And I think right. that's a great way to do it. But yeah, I mean, I definitely saw someone who didn't belong there that night. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was the really weird. The guy was weird. probably just like, hey, here's the party to watch. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, from, like, the actor's standpoint, it is very fun. And, like, they call it um, dropping bodies when you scare someone so bad they fall to the floor. <laughs> and when you do that there's just a level of satisfaction that <laughs> you're just like man I scared the crap out of you and like I bet even now I'm sure everyone does this like I'll hide and pop out and scare my boyfriend or I'll do it to the dog and like it's just fun and right. he's done it to me and like a few times he's done it and it has scared the shit out of me but I still <laughs> laugh because I'm like you got me good yeah totally <laughs> But yeah, I mean, if I were, if I were, if that ghost was an intelligent entity and like they're able to like see and understand and interact, I would watch that show. I'd be like, oh, you got that person good. They're, they're <laughs> right. crying. They're on the ground. That That's very funny that they paid so much money to come do this to themselves. Right. Right. <laughs> that's so funny. I have a friend who has a theory that ghosts or spirits he thinks that they're basically like energetic imprints left over that it's not necessarily an intelligent being as much as just an energy that's left over that still has a connection to the shape it was once attached to, which is rather esoteric. But in this instance, that sounds kind of like that could be this too, or it's just a man smoking mm -hmm. and that's it. Like he wasn't doing anything else. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe that man sat there and smoked every night on his break or something. You know what I mean? And yeah. Yeah. Although you only saw him at one time. Well, and I also wonder too, like people with all of this in this realm, people think, you know, sometimes certain people are more susceptible or you have to be open to it Mm -hmm. because, you know, as adults, we rationalize a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw that it must be this. Um, So I don't know, maybe I did see something else, but I thought it was another actor or I thought it was a guest, you know, an audience member. Right. Who knows? But right. Yeah, it was definitely that was my experience at Eastern State. And it was definitely weird. It was <laughs> I like I was being paid to scare people. I then got scared and hid in the spinny barrel. <laughs> so <laughs> I was just like, this is a little too weird for me. <laughs> Very meta. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, going back to what you said about your friend, I do think that, you know, if ghosts could be proven to be real it i you know we are made of energy and electricity and right. if that's the case then maybe there is some sort of imprint left behind right right yeah wow it's very mm-hmm. weird yeah and i mean i think it just it furthers the question it just it's all fueled by the question of what happens after you know the lights go out for us yeah. and you know, how do we deal with that? And I right. think that's a really interesting, you know, we're here in 2020 and culturally we still haven't found an answer or, right. you know, rationale. Yeah. We still don't have actual concrete evidence, proof, rules, just more and more sort of conjecture and Maybe it more explanation of brain processes as as one as the body shuts down, but that's about it. I'm just thinking of those. The book, um, there was a book I had recently read about, not proof of heaven, but a different book about a boy who claimed that he went to heaven, talked to angels, and they came back. But then they proved he said he that that, that was something his father had fabricated while he was in the mm. hospital. That it's not true. I can't remember their names, but. The, the publisher, which was a Christian publisher, had then pulled the book from shelves as soon as the little boy, who was now at this point like a teenager, said, no, it didn't really happen. My dad made all that up. Um, the dad still claims to date that, in fact, <clears throat> his son told him those stories and he assumed it really was an angel and really was God. But I'm just saying, like using that as an example of, you know, there's like people still have these experiences this boy said he didn't but there are other people who claim to have these experiences and i think the best i've read is that certain scientists have explained brain functioning as you shut as the human body shuts down that could explain their experiences and the way Mm -hmm. the imagination works and at the same time i'm like well who are we to say you know really we don't know we just don't and it does seem we think we're so modern and so scientifically advanced that we think we should know but I don't know. Yeah, well, and I, I do wonder, too, if culturally, if as people, we had never been exposed to the idea of the paranormal or the idea of the occult. And we were just, you know, it's just us. It's just plants and whatever around us. Would we come up with that idea or was it some sort of experience that people then would, you know. Right come up with the definition for right so i feel like there's so much out there that maybe we haven't discovered yet or that not many people know about about our brains that who knows maybe what i saw was a malfunction of my own brain you know yeah right so weird but i think it's fun to wonder all the what ifs about it totally (laughs) totally (laughs) So, Erin, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing all of your stories. They were super spooky. <laughs> I, uh, thank you for having me. Maybe, yeah. I, I wonder if maybe you saw your dad's doppelganger. Oh. You know, it could have been just like his double or something if he wasn't there maybe. in the silo. Um, but yeah, people who want to follow Erin should check her out on Instagram. She's at Erin Carrera LA. And she's also in 
Alabama Snake on HBO, which I can't wait to check out. <laughs> um, people who are listening, uh, reviews and ratings where you listen to podcasts and sharing stuff on social media really helps other people find this podcast. And I think the same might go for movies and stuff like Aaron is in, you know, go on Rotten Tomatoes, give that give that movie a hundred percent when you can um yes. and <laughs> you can find this will scare you on instagram facebook twitter and youtube give us a follow leave a review and i hope everyone has a very good creepy day